So yesterday we started talking about post requests. We started talking about making post requests yesterday. So far, before yesterday, we only made get request. Even yesterday, we actually started off by making a get request in order to get our lab questions populated in the table view. So that was the first part of our project yesterday. We built out a get request um, API client to get back the lab questions. The objective of our app is to have um, users post a question, a lab question, using that plus uh, button there in the upper right corner. So the user is able to post, and the user is also able to see other questions, right? So that's the MVP of the app. MVP, minimal viable product. And I'm talking about user stories here. We haven't exactly had a lecture on user stories, whether it be a technical lecture or a behavioral lecture or in industry fluency lecture or presentation. But basically, think of a user story like actions your user could do. So you could actually write it down somewhere, what a user story is. It's an action on behalf of the user. User can add a lab question. Right? The user should be able to add a lab question. So as we build our app out, we could build it out using user stories and make sure that the user stories we're using is the MVP of the product and we're not going outside of the user stories based on some feature your friend asks you, right? Because there'll be a lot of features that'll be asked. When, once people see your app, they'll be like, hey, maybe you add a feature to do this or maybe you add a feature to do that. But you stick to your, your user stories, you build out the sketch of your application, you stick to your MVP, Based on the objective of your app, you write out user stories. User can add a lab question. User can see lab questions. User can answer a lab question. For our particular MVP, the user, there's no answers there, but we could add it later if we do have time, right? So the user stories for our app so far is user can see lab questions, right, in a feed, and user can add a lab question. Those are the two basic user stories for our application, right? The first user story is pretty much done. The user can see lab questions. We all can see questions, but we haven't gotten to the part of adding a question. User can add a question, right? So those are user stories. And as you building out your holiday project, we all will be building out some holiday project. Um, and we'll be demoing that project when we come back from the break, right? So whatever project you're building out, think of the user stories of the project. If it's a guitar app I'm making, is Christian here? Is Christian is right here? If I'm making a guitar app, right, user can see guitars. User can select a guitar. You could, user could hear a chord from a guitar, right? Those are already three user stories. That's already a big app. That's what probably already the whole two weeks there, right? Because I could see guitars. I could hear the chord of it and see if I really like it. And in unit four, user can add a favorite guitar, right? User can delete a favorite guitar. User can share a guitar, right, to a friend, right? They see a cool guitar they want, they could share it out. Uh, user can purchase a guitar, maybe. If you click on it, maybe you go to Amazon, whatever it is, right? So that's how we should think of our product. What, what the, what's the abilities of that user with my application? Cool. So with that said, uh, let us go to the testing part of the application. Let me zoom in here. Let's zoom in, let me change my preferences. Let's get to the testing part of our application. Because right now, we will get to post, we'll create, a, uh, we'll create an asynchronous test to actually create a post. And once that's successful, we'll go ahead and we'll create an API client for that post. Everybody? Right? So we'll start off, we have a test already written for us, but there's one part of the test that's broken. Do we all have access to the lab questions test, right? So if we navigate over to our project folder and we go down to lab questions test here, we'll see we have one test, one unit class test called lab questions test. So if we click on it, it will get us to this lab questions test and there's one test right now, it's called test post lab question, right? So I'm testing posting a lab question. A lab question has a title. Please change the title so it's unique to you. So when you make that test, you know it was yours. So go ahead and edit, like edit here. I'll keep mine the same, but please edit the title to some title that's relevant to you. 
and some question that you had, right? So let's make it relevant to us. So when we post it, it's unique to us. Because right now we don't have any username or anything like that. So the one way to identify that it was you is by the title. At some point, we'll make the title unique. Maybe today, maybe Monday, if we keep working on this project. But for now, the titles are not unique, but that will be one way to identify really a uniqueness of the title. Um, if you're comfortable, you could even put your name on the title here. So I could probably do something like this, Alex P. Right. We don't have a username. We'll just get a random, na a random name for now. But there's a lot of refactoring we could do with that. The objective is just for t uh, posting. It's not to make that perfect app to ship to the App Store. It's to post. Uh, so we have a title. We have a lab name. Uh, choose a lab name that gives you difficulty, whatever. Uh, give it a description. That, like, hey, you want to be more descriptive of that particular question you have, um, right? Like, hey, not able to use the SVG URL. What else can I do to get the image URL? Something like that. All right. So make sure that we edit those three parameters there. Next up, the created at. The created at, there's no editing there that you need to do. So if we command click on the get ISO timestamp and we jump to definition, it takes us to our extension. We have our extension. It's an extension on the string struct. It's an extension on the string struct. What does it do for us? Basically, this extension here creates a timestamp. What is a timestamp? A timestamp basically says, hey, this product was created at this date on that time. Okay, That's a timestamp. The created date and time of the object, right? That's something you want with every project or a project, every object you're creating and you want to send it to some database or some web API, you want to have a timestamp on it, right? That comes in very valuable. For sorting example, our table will be sorted by, by date. Without a date, you'll sort by the name of the um, question, that's not exactly relevant. You want to see based on date how. Yes, go ahead. Sorry, can you speak a little bit here? I can't see back here. Bigger. Bigger. Tell me when. Yes, okay, cool. All right, so we have our extension on string. What does it do? It returns us. It returns us a uh, ISO date formatter. But the big, one second, actually I put this the wrong place. This should go down here. Because the first one just returns us a formatter. The first one returns us a formatter. Sorry about that. Returns an ISO 8601 uh, date formatter. We've worked with date formatter before, but we haven't quite worked with ISO date formatter. Some of us, some of us have worked with ISO date formatter, like ad hoc. But basically, this is a standard, right? This ISO 8601 is a standard, right? It's an international date standard that says a date should appear in a certain way, right? A date should appear in a certain way to make it ISO 8601. So web APIs. If they're using 8601, it will be compliant to our, IO, um, to our iOS app, right? And our iOS app, we have a framework called ISO 81, ISO 8601 date formatter. It takes a web format string, and it, it's able to work with that string, right? Because that string itself is compatible with the ISO 8601 format, OK? So what we'll be doing, we'll actually be creating ourselves a date format that's compatible with ISO 8601. And that date format, you could put in different options on it. Here, the current time zone is whatever time zone we're in right now. It will take that time zone, right? Here, we US uh, Eastern Standard Time. That's the time zone it will take. Format options, you could put in format options here. Some of the options are internet date time. I want the full date in my date. I want the full time. I want fractional seconds as well. This option, make sure you have that option if anything else. Okay. 
And next, I have a width colon separated in time zone. As far as like the intricacies of the ISO date formatter, you could go deeper into it and see what more options we have there. But this would work for any use case as far as like the apps we're working with if the date is ISO date formatter. Okay? Great. So what this does, it returns us a formatter, and where we actually create the timestamp is here. What we want is a string. So I pass it on string. I say, just return me a date stamp that is a string format. I don't want a date format, because I can't exactly send that up to my web API. But I want a date. So basically, this gets a date object. The date object will be the current date. The way we get the current date and time is by simply saying date open parents, close parents. That gets us the exact date and time of that creation of that object. Right? This is what we do here. So that gets us the exact date and time. Current date and time. So with our formatter, we pass it a date object, and it returns us a timestamp, which is a string here. We just call it timestamp, because timestamp, as we said, it creates like a timestamp for that particular object. So you have a date and a time associated to it. And it returns us a string. And that's it. That string now is called the created at uh, property. That will be the string there. OK? Again, date could be very complex. We have this utility extension here. We could use it. Anytime we want to create some sort of timestamp, we could use that extension. We might not get to the rest of it, but as we come to each of it, we'll come back and we'll talk about it. If you have any questions, we'll come back and talk about it. Any questions about this extension so far? First function gets us a date formatter, an ISO date formatter, right? Not the regular date formatter we've been using. It gets us a specific standard formatter. With that formatter, we get a string from the date. That's all we need to know for now. With that particular formatter here that we get back from our function that we wrote, we pass it a date object. That date object here is the current date and time. It gets converted to a string, and that string we added to our lab questions object. Yes, Chelsea. We don't have a date uh, picker. The um, part of that creating the object, when we create our question, we'll say created it, created that, and we'll just call on the on the object created at dot get uh, ISO timestamp. So on the string, the way we'll use this is not a picker. Simply, the way we'll be using it is saying string dot get ISO timestamp, and it returns us a timestamp of, what's that? Yeah, from when we make the question, right? So we, we don't have any like picker, because that would not be accurate. Now you're creating a question with any date that you want. The question has to be created on that date at that time. It's almost like, again, I go to Instagram, you create a post, it has a timestamp. That way Instagram itself, on the feed, they're able to sort it by date. They're not, so, well, it depends on the algorithm sometimes. They could sort by popular or whatever it is to obviously make the money. But ideally, it's sorted by time. Okay? Twitter as well. Any sort of time feed you're watching, time feed, any, right? Time feed. Any sort of feed you're watching, it's normally by time. News as well, it's sorted by time. So that's why we created the timestamp. And any object you're creating that you want to store, always associate a timestamp with it, right? Okay, so let's go back. Any other questions before we go back to the test? Okay, so let's go back to the test here. All right, so here we have, um, Chelsea, this is your question. We don't have a picker. In our object, simply we'll be saying string dot get me a timestamp. Okay, and that function we wrote on string. So here we're making use of an extension, and this is uh, get ISO timestamp is an extension on string. Okay? As we saw yesterday and the day before and the week before, first we started off with an extension on UI image to get us an image. 
Then yesterday we had an extension on UI view controller to get us an alert, right? We saw how that worked and how easy that was to just say show alert and pass it some message and a title. And here today we're seeing how easy it is to get some sort of timestamp back. Once we have that extension in place, it's really easy at any part of our code base to say string, get me a timestamp, okay? So we're not writing that code everywhere. Anytime you catch yourself writing code everywhere on a type, stop yourself, write an extension for it, all right? Next up, we have posted question. Posted question will be a different uh, struct as opposed to our question struct. This posted question doesn't have an ID because the ID will get created automatically by the web API. So we're not sending up an ID, right? But what we're sending up is a title, a lab name, a description, and the created at. Those are the objects we're sending up to the web API. The rest of the, ob the, rest of the properties the web API has, it will give us an automatic avatar. It will give us a random uh, name, okay? Those are the things it will give us randomly. Great. So we need to stop here because our test is broken. We do not have a posted question model. So let's go create one. So right in my models, I will create a new file. I'll create a new file. I'll call it posted question. Let me zoom in here so we all see the name. It's called posted question. It's part of the models folder. And the target, make sure the targets is lab questions, please. Make sure the targets is lab questions and not lab questions test. And the file name is posted question. At this point, we'll create. Okay, great. So let's create our struct called posted question. Since we're only using that question to upload data, what should it conform to? Encodable, right? Very good. So here we'll conform to encodable. Not encoder, by the way. Be careful there. Encodable. Okay, what do we have here? We have a title that we want to set up, which is a string. We have a lab name. We have a description, and we have a created app. And created app here is the timestamp of the created date of the question. Cool. No. Well, keep it in order here, actually, because we have the test written the same way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Keep the order the same as we have here. Order than that, you'll have to go shuffle off your initializer. So keep the order the same. Title, lab name, description, created that. So our test sees the same. Uh, the initializer. The initializer on the test is expecting that order. If we didn't write it yet, then we could have, the order wouldn't matter. But since we have an initialize already with that order, let's keep it the same. Okay, great. Yes, yes, yes. Is there a we could use the question model, but now we have to do some optional and we have to do some more work to make sure that, because uh, we'll get a decoding error when we try to get that object back down, right? Because when we send, if we use the same object, we'll have to say optionals. Because the avatar, we're not sending the avatar up. We're not sending the name up. There's a bunch of objects we're not sending up. But in a true app, we would have access to all those properties. We would be able to use the same object. Does that make sense? Because in, like for example, in unit four, we'll be able to create a photo, a save a photo, send a photo up. That way we'll be able to do that. So like in unit four, we'll be able to create the same object, use the same object. But for the purposes of what we're doing now, we don't have access to that avatar. We cannot set it up. Cool? Great. Great question. Um, okay, so let's move on here. Let's go back to the test. And test, test, test. Okay. 
Let's go back to the test. At this point, if we build, it should see a posted question if we named it the same. Build not run the test yet. Just build, make sure you have no errors. Let's keep going through the test before we actually run the test. So next up, we have our posted question. Any, everybody, no errors, right? We all, I'm sorry? OK. So we have our lab. We created a question. We called it lab. So far, we've only used JSON decoder. We've only used JSON decoder. Today, we see a JSON encoder. So here, I'm encoding my lab. My lab is a model. My lab is a Swift model. I'm taking that lab. I'm encoding it to data. And I'm getting back data here. For now, in the test, we optionally banged it there. But in our actual API client, we won't do that. right? We'll use a do catch there. But for here, for the test, we know the object, the object we created. So we actually just use a bang there. So we use JSON encoder. We encode lab. Lab is now a data object. Okay? Lab is now a data object. So remember, encoding gets you data. Decoding gets you a Swift model. Okay. Next up, since this is an asynchronous test, we need an expectation. So we have our expectation here. The description is lab posted successfully. We need a URL. We need somewhere to send that data to. Where are we sending that data to? We're sending that data to the same endpoint that we use for the get. The same endpoint that we use in Postman, that same endpoint here that we used in Postman yesterday to get all the questions, this is the same endpoint we post into. Okay? So we post into that endpoint, so we need that URL. Yesterday we used the request on get. Yesterday we used the URL request on get. The only thing we needed yesterday was the URL. We comment at the rest of it, right? We said we'll come back to it today, which we will. The things you need for a post is you need to change the HTTP method from get. Get is the default. Get is the default here. So if you do not specify anything, get is the default. For the HTTP method, as a matter of fact, if you totally ignore this, it's a get request, OK? But here, we cannot ignore it because we're making a post request. The request needs to know it's posting. Yesterday, we started talking about the HTTP body needing data. The HTTP body, our request now, has data associated to it. We're pushing data to the web. Our data is the question. Yes? It would crash the app. It would probably not work. It would probably do give you bad data on the other end. OK? Any of those would be valid. So here, we have our request. It has a body. Body expects data. We have data. And Tiffany, the next part, if you omit, will also give you bad data. If you do not say what type of data it is on line 38, this will also give you corrupt, not even corrupted, but mildly formatted data. It won't be JSON. It won't be JSON. It's just going to be a string with um, escaping characters. It will be not JSON anymore. So we have to specify on line 38 what type of data we're sending up. Is it an image? Is it JSON? Is it HTML? Is it an MP3, um, MP3 file? We need to specify what type of data we're sending up. Here, the data we're sending up is JSON. So this is standard. I can't just put in any type here. This is a standard type. It's a string, application, forward slash, JSON. For the purposes of um, the rest of the unit three, we'll all only be sending up JSON. Okay, so that is what we use. And the header, the type of header, the name of the header is a content type. Right? So that's the same throughout all JSON you're sending up. We don't change that content type. Application JSON stays the same as long as you work on the JSON. And the type, the header, like the actual information, the header is like, what is that object? The header here is content type. That's the name of it. Uh, that's what we're sending up in the request. Right now, the request has all that information. Remember, the request is a package that we send into the web. So that request has all that information. It has the data associated to it. 
it has the type of HTTP method associated to it, it has the data, and it has the type of data that it's sending up. All that you need for post. So post is not as straightforward as get. Okay? So that's enough information for our post to work. Yes, go ahead. No, I'm going to talk about that right now. So the network helper is the same as we've seen before. We have our network helper talking to URL session. It passes the request to URL session. The request is that whole package we just created. We package URL requests with HTTP method, with the body, which is data, with the type of data. It has a URL already as well. Right? There's a lot there in the request. You see that? In that request, we have a lot of data and um, metadata information about the request. Here we have the URL. Next, we have the HTTP method type. Next, we have the data we're sending up. Next, we have the type of data we're sending up. You can say type of data, yeah, type of data multimedia. Right. So we see what the relevance of a URL request is as opposed to a URL. A URL does not allow you to package all that information in a URL. The URL is a simple string, that's it. But a URL request enables you to package all that information in the request as you're sending it up to the web API. There's much more you could do there. You could add many more headers. There's a lot more information you could package in the request. But for a basic request and for the purposes of our assessment, this is what we need to know. If you have to make a post request, those are the things you need to do. And if you forget 38, bad things will happen. Right? Your JSON is not JSON anymore. It's just strings that's just interpolated with um, escape characters. Right? So if you try to get that um, JSON back, it will keep saying mildly formatted JSON. Right? It's not JSON. It cannot be read as JSON. We need to specify it's JSON on 38. So in our assessment, please don't forget that line. Again, in our assessment, please don't forget that line. Okay, questions? Okay, cool. So we spoke about Network Helper. Uh, Network Helper basically takes in the request and the regular stuff of getting data or an error is happening here. If I get data back, I'm simply saying, is the title of the lab the same as the title of the lab that I got created? Because when the post happens, it gives us a data object back and from that data object, actually, from that data object, I simply created a created lab, a created lab, where is it? A created lab model here that simply says, give me the created at and give me the title. And is the title the same as the title I created here? So whatever title you added in the lab, is that title the same as the one that got created? That's the test, okay? That is the test there. Any questions before we actually run the test? And a couple things I'm asking of you, please update the title, the lab name, and the description. Make it your own. Um, keep it relevant to the labs we've been doing so that it's also unique to you. If you want, you could also append your name there on the end of the title. So when we all go to, uh, when we all go to Postman to validate, like, are we getting, actually not even Postman, we have the app. Uh, we could go to Postman, or we could also go to our app to validate that we do have, or we are seeing the titles. Everybody? Everybody? Any questions before we run the test? Let's see if we actually crash the API. Uh, right. So, okay. So if we all have no more questions, then simply command you. Command you once, please, for now.
Okay, so mine got created. I got a green check that says that it got created. Let's go validate in Postman. Please don't do multiple tests for now. Just do one test. If it's green, you're good. Anybody got a red error? So everybody got green, correct? Okay, so let's go ahead. Go to Postman, the same link that we had yesterday for our lab questions. Simply click on the send button on your get request. Please, not a post. Did you post? Okay, you have it there, right? Okay, so I'll click on send. And now we have more data than we had before. I'm seeing Jaheed, I'm seeing Eric, or Eri. I'm seeing Miss Zeham, Zeman, who's this? I now would be seeing, oh, sorry, I'm seeing the wrong thing, reading the wrong thing. Uh, Luba, Kelby, that's Kelby, sorry, I was reading name, not um, the thing. Uh, cool. So people are posting. Was everybody able to see the name there? Say that again. Okay. Uh, oh, the link is the same link in the test. No, 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 not post. Yeah, get. Yes. Anybody not able to see their question in Postman? Anybody else not able to see the test? You could simply do a command F in Postman and find your name. Maybe we add search. We could do a lot of things with that app. Uh, Majet, you said you had a question? What's that? Did your test pass? Okay, according to Luba, you could also run the app. So let's get back, unless we have any questions. Yeah. We posted a question to the web API. Because we're getting the information, because we posted already. Uh, to clarify, in the test, we posted the question. Everybody? In the test, we posted the question. We send the question out. In Postman, we verify is our question there. And then in our app, we also do the same. So run your app, command R. Command R. What's that, uh, Amini? App error. Somebody sent bad data. That's what that is. Um, now you need to investigate. Uh, let's see. We would get bad error for sure. Somebody's either. Um, okay. 
would add a new ID. Yeah, we'll add a new ID. Uh, okay, somebody sent something up without a title. Um, guys, in Postman, we're not posting. That's going to break the API for now. In Postman, we only get. We don't post. If you post, the app will actually break. Uh, let's see. So this one is bad as well. Okay. That looks <laughs> fine. Say that again. I'm just editing the stuff that was not valid. Oscar, was that your prank? <laughs> You trolling, you trolling me? Okay, uh, let's see. One second, let's verify here first. Okay, everybody should be able to get lab questions. Couple of things I ask of you. If you're running the test, that's fine. If you go to Postman, we're doing a get, not a post. We go to Postman to do gets, everybody? The app will be the one posting. Postman, we validate with a GET request. OK? So we have our lab question showing up here. Great. Um, yes, sir? Uh, so the title? The title. When you change the title. Uh, okay. All right, so we wrote a test uh, to post. Now let's go over to our, let's go over to our controller to actually write the posting code. We validated our test works. Now let's go over and write our controller code for the create, the create view controller, where we're actually getting that data or from the user. That's where we need to go now. Say that again. Yeah, it's a test file. It actually does an asynchronous test against the network. So it actually makes the test real time. And it posts. It posts, yes. Because remember, we have our network helper here. So Luba's question is, how does the test actually send data? The, de the test sends data because it's actually working with the network helper. It's actually making the network helper itself make the request. That's not a fake request. It's an actual, it's a real request. So it's as if this is part of the actual app. In our particular example, maybe we would do like a mock test, a fake test. But in our example, we're showing how to use post. And we're posting first in that asynchronous test. And then we'll take that knowledge over to the controller and the API client. But yes, there's actually testing where in a real development environment, you will have a, develop, a, a developer. Um, yeah, one second. In a real developer environment, you will have production code where users are seeing it. And you'll have development code where you have a fake server or something testing exactly this. I could delete it. We're not going to see delete, but I could delete it. Right? I could delete the data on my part. But we don't want to do too much right now. I want us to only know how to do get really good and how to do post really good. There's many more methods we have. Right? You see? She's asking for it, right? not me. Um, but for now, for assessment, I want us to really know how to post and really know how to get. If I say make a get request and I say make a, po a post request, we know how to do it. If I add delete in there, you have to go back and add more stuff in the delegate. You have to delete. You have to do commit. You have to do a lot of things. You have to verify your data is deleted. I have to do, put some extra validation in there to make sure the thing you're deleting is yours. Right? You don't want to delete anybody's lab question. So I have a question. So if you already posted to our app, what is this post in the postman? Uh, the post in postman. Uh, this is a get, right? Yeah. This is get. We have no post here. Yeah, no. The second is post. The second is post. This one? Oh, you mean the more? There's more methods. Yeah, yeah there's more methods. So what does it mean in postman that postman? We could post the same way we did the test. We could make a post in postman. 
to post a lab question, to send a lab question to the web server. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Postman could do all the requests that we do in code. Part of this uh, software is to help us to navigate across making web application, web requests, web responses. So we could get, we could post, we could update from Postman. Cool. But for the purposes of now, we'll only be doing get in Postman for now. And the post will do it in the app. Cool? Good. Uh, good, good, good. Okay, so let us keep going. Any other questions? Anybody else did not successfully run the test? Yeah. So, when you were saying that, okay, I'm a little confused with this other so for the network that the public has been that we're trying to get a created in the app, but does it have the same title as our Created lab basically is a small structure that just validates if I have a title. If my title coming down from the web is the same that I pushed up. The created lab, if I go back to the test here, that created lab only validates is the title that got created, is it the same title? Yes. That's all it validates. Okay, cool. Uh, so let's go over to our create question controller. There's a lot of work we need to do there. Some of the work we need to do there is set up a picker view. Is set up the data for the picker view. We haven't seen a picker view yet, so we'll see what a picker view looks like. Let's go over to our main storyboard and see the UI for this view controller. The UI is set up already. The UI for that particular controller is where we create our question. This is the UI. If we all navigate to storyboard, we have the UI. Let's go over that UI. So the create question controller, it has a text field where the user puts in the title for the text, the title for the lab question. It has a text view. The text view is where the user puts the description for the lab. The description will be longer than the title. It will be more descriptive as to what the question is. And we have our picker view. Our picker view will have some labs that we're familiar with. So we could scroll through the picker view and select the, quest, select the lab we're talking about, right? For example, concurrency or um, the comic or parsing JSON, whatever lab we're talking about, that's where it's gonna show up in the picker view. The picker view allows the user to go through choices and pick one of them. Especially if you wanna bulletproof your app, you don't want the user to put in any lab. So this is one of the ways where you can make sure the user is selecting a lab that exists, right? So anytime, it's almost like an enum, right? where you want to make sure it's finite, it's not outside of your um, object, you use a picker view to make sure the user is selecting the correct choice. Because if you give the user a text field and put in some lab number, some lab name, they'll put in whatever name they want, right? Um, they'll probably put extra spaces in there, which we could take care of, yes we can, but they'll put in names there that doesn't associate it to any labs we know. So we want to restrict them to labs that we know, we have a picker view, they're restricted, they cannot go beyond that, okay? So a picker view is excellent for that. Uh, great, so let's open up our assistant editor to connect them. Open up, any questions about this UI? Any questions about, yes, I see a hand up. Go ahead. Let me see, let me go back, let me go back, let me go back. Let me open that up. Uh, zoom, zoom, zoom. So let's see. Uh, this navigation view here. Right. 
Oh, 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 good question. That gives us access to the nav bar. If we do not um, embed a view controller in a nav bar, we don't have access to the navigation bar, and we cannot add the bar button items. Do you see the bar button items there cancel and uh, create? That is only possible because of the navigation controller. If you do not have a navigation controller, you only have a view controller, and you don't have access to the navigation bar to add those two bar items at the top. So the two bar items I'm referring to. So when I segue from my table view, right, it has now, it's embedded, this view controller is embedded in a navigation controller. So I'm able to get access to the nav bar to add in a cancel button and to add in a create button. If I do not embed it in a navigation controller, I don't have access to a nav bar. And now I need to add my own UI to dismiss or whatever I want to do. I would have to create like a create button on my view controller. Right? So that gives us access to the nav bar there. Because other than that, it would simply have a view controller without any nav bar. Let me show you what I'm talking about. So don't, don't do this. Um, Let's just see what I'm talking about and what Cameron question is. So I'll simply go ahead and add a view controller here. I'll add a view controller right above this guy. And what are we going to get here? Do we have a button? We have no button. Uh, No, 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 no. I'm just showing some illustration here. No view controller. I'll add a button here. And from this button, I will go ahead, I'll drag up to this view, and I'll say show. Right? It has, this particular one has a nav controller already, so it's going to have also a nav controller. But if I did not embed the first one in the nav controller, I would not have it. Let's see. One second. Let's go back. Let's go back. Back, back, back. Uh, this one has enough controller. I think your question is why do I need to do this here, right? Okay, so if we remove this, and where am I coming from? I'm coming from here. Control drag here and show. All right, that was your question? Yeah. All right, so we still have it. But there's situations where you do not have the nav bar anymore. And you need to embed your view controller in a nav controller. It does exist. You'll come to those situations. For example, if you have a view controller, a plain view controller, and you want to segue away from it, you won't have a nav bar. So somebody needs to be in a nav controller. Right? In that case, we had one already, so that wasn't needed. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so let's fix that here. You could leave yours the same. Just leave yours the same for now. Don't do any changes. Okay. So let's go back. Where are we now? I think we are connecting. Let's go ahead and connect the outlets over to our controller. What are we connecting? We're connecting the text field, we're connecting the text view, and we're connecting the picker view. Those are the outlets we're connecting to our controller. Let's go ahead and do that. So here, first off, I'll take my text field, control drag to my questions controller. And what are we gonna call this? We'll call this title text field. Title text field connected. Next up, we have our text view. Our text view will simply call question text, question text view. Sorry. So question text view. Question text view. And our picker view will simply call lab picker view. So picker view, picker view, picker view. Uh, lab, lab picker view. So those are the three 
outlets we have. We have our text field, we have our text view, and we have our lab picker view. Okay, next we need data. We said we have a picker view. We need data for the picker view. Let's go ahead and create some data for it. The data we'll simply call labs. And labs is an array of strings. We'll start off with concurrency, our favorite lab. We have comic. Uh, do I need this anymore? I could take this no. Can you not see Ian? Sorry. OK. Uh, comic, concurrency, parsing. JSON, weather, color, user. Next up, we have image and error handling. Stocks people. Uh, don't forget here, stocks people. Intro to unit testing. Jokes, Star Wars. Trivia. Okay, so we have our labs array. Uh, we're not changing this, we could make this a let. And we'll sort it. Ascending by default. So if I say dot sorted, it does it ascending by default, meaning A to Z. So that data will be for our peak of view. So this particular array here will be the data source, uh, data for our peak of view. The same way we have a table view that expects data, our peak of view itself has a data source. And that data source needs the data. That would be the data. The data will be the labs. So as we go through our peak of view, we'll be able to select a lab by scrolling through that peak of view up and down. The picker view, very similar to the table view, has two required protocols. One of those method protocols will be number of components. How many components does the picker view have? Is it one? Is it two? Is it three? In that example here, our picker view has one component, meaning one column. Component is the same as saying a column. In that particular picker view, our picker view will also have one component. The number of rows will be the number of labs I have. Labs that count will be the, the number of rows my picker view has. So those are the two items the picker view needs for the data source. Number of components, number of rows. Very similar to the table view. Our dead picker did not have a data source, did not have a delegate. Our dead picker is a control. 
I control drag from my date picker. If I select the date, it gets, a, it gets updated in my IB action. So the date picker wasn't similar to the picker view in that sense. The picker view has a data source and a delegate. The date picker does not. We used date picker before in the scheduler app. OK, cool. So let's move on to our viewed load here. We're making sure to call super viewed load. So we have our lab picker view. Let's set it up. So configure, configure the picker view. So we have our lab picker view. It has a data source, as we said. We set it to self, very similar to a table view. And we'll also need access to the delegate. The delegate is the one returning the titles for each row. And we need a variable to keep track of what is the current lab the user selected. So here we need a variable, so a variable to track the current uh, selected lab in the picker view. And we'll create a variable for this. It's going to be simply called, let's make it private. We'll make it private so nobody else has access to it. It's only this view controller that needs a lab name. Uh, lab name will be some string here. And we start off by saying, sorry, var. We start off by saying lab name will be whatever the picker view first element is. So lab name will get set to our lab picker view. Not lab picker view, our labs. That first. So set default lab is the first row in the picker view. Okay, so so far we connected our three outlets. We added an array of labs. We have a lab name to keep track of what is the selected lab. There's a did select in our picker view, so every time the user changes it, this lab name will change. So lab name, lab name will be the current selected uh, row. Okay. Uh, we don't have a did set here. Uh, we don't have a did set here. Every time the, uh, the, the user selects a picker, uh, a row, the lab name will just change. The lab name will change to that lab itself. Um, it's when we create, when we click on the create button, then the lab will get posted. Right now, lab name is equal to the first lab in the array. Oh. Um, no, no, no. 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 I did? You said? Tanya? Okay, if I did, then I. Okay, so 
Yeah, there's no did set there, sorry. Uh, no, I said did select. That's what I said. Did select, when the user, there's a did select method that gets called when the user changes the peak of view. Did select, not did set. No, it hasn't been made yet. No, we'll do it now. So let's go ahead and create an extension for it. So let's create an extension for our data source for the peak of view and also for uh, UI peak of view data source an extension for create question uh, UI peak of view delegate. Let's just go over to the documentation so I show us what the peak of view does or gives us. Um, we'll come back to the extensions. We'll come back to the extensions. Let's just go see what the API is. So here we have a UI peak of view, not a date picker. We have UI date picker, which we saw earlier in unit three. And we saw uh, UI peak of view today. So here, it's a view that uses a spinning wheel, right? We've seen, we've used that everywhere. Android has it too, right? Um, it allows a user to select some option. What do we have? We have a UI pick of view data source, and we also have a delegate. The data source says, that's the data part of that UI. Give me data. So the data source enables us to pass the data for the pick of view, and the delegate will give us access to the title for each row. So here we have the delegate, which we registered ourselves at. We have number of components. How many components do we have? Right now, we have one component, one column. A component is the same as a column. We also have reload, or, um, reload components. We'll come in that, into that in unit four. Very similar to reload data on a table view. My pick of view could change, and I could say reload all components. So now I get a fresh set of components based on if I'm getting components from a web API. Let's go to the data source. So UI pick of view data source has number of components, right? Those are the two that's required. Number of components, I'll zoom in here, sorry. I have number of components. How many components do I have? Here, we're gonna return how many components? Yeah, it's a little one of those things. Um, we'll have one column, so one, according to Chelsea. Right, so we'll have one column, one component gets returned. Everybody? Column, component. So number of rows for um, our particular pick of view will be? Labs.count, all right, everybody sees that? So for number of rows, we'll say uh, return labs.count, whatever that count is. And for number of components, we'll say one. Everybody with me? Cool? So those are the two we're interested in, and those are the two. You are listening, but you are listening, right? Oh, you're reading. OK, I'll slug that out. I'll call by the peak of view when it needs the, to know the number of components. And here we have required. Think of this like a table view. It's the same. It's just a different UI. Because we only want one. If you have, uh, let me see if I could show us a little illustration real quick. Um, okay, let's go here somewhere. Ah, it died. No, that's okay. Um, if you see our UI here, we have one component, one column. Do you have an iPhone? No, do you have an iPhone? Okay, if you use the clock app or whatever, yeah. every one of those you're scrolling up and down is a component. Everybody? Every one of those columns we're scrolling up and down is a component. So in example, our, if we all have iPhones, or please share an iPhone. Like you want to send them on, you have the have Exactly. So according to the documentation, well, go to, if you have an iPhone, everybody go to the clock app. Everybody go to the clock app, right? <laughs> What's that? Okay, so go to your clock app, and we all see a plus icon, right, on the right. So click on it. About we're about to create some alarm, right? 
And every one of those we could scroll up and down is a component. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> Anybody else get that? Tanya's like, I want to laugh, but I don't know what it is. Um, <laughs> do we all have access to the clock app? All right? We all saw the components here. How many components do we have in the alarm? Three. Three, right? Uh, cool. <laughs> all right, so that was that there. Very good. Um, cool. So our particular, if we go back to the documentation, number of components, we return one. Number of rows, we return labs that count. And that's it for the, um, the data source. And again, those are required. Required. Okay, not much more there. Let's go over to the delegate. Delegate. If I click on the delegate. <coughs> okay. The delegate here implements the required methods of a protocol to return the height, width, row title. I mean, they say required here, but it's not required. It's more like if you want those things, those are the methods you need. Um, great. So here we have row height. You could change the height of the row. Like we saw with the delegate on a table view, I could change the height of the cell. I could change the width of a component. But the big things we after in this particular project is the title for row. It's almost like that should be required, right? But it's not, right? Um, so on the delegate, I need to implement the delegate, and I need to implement this method called title for row. Title for row will return every title for the lab. Everybody, right? It returns the title for the lab. Very similar to like title for section. It will have a question mark. It's a weird API, right? Like that should be required. The minute you say pick a view that whatever. And that should be like a data source, if you think about it, right? Um, but anyway, uh, we need to implement it, title for row. And for that, we're going to return the labs um, open square bracket row. And that will return the, the row for that particular, the title for that particular row. OK, so those are what we're implementing. Let's, any questions about the documentation? Minus me sending it out. And then we'll definitely be bookmarking it. Already bookmarked. Look at that. Go, Christian. Very good. Uh, so I slack it in there. Very good. Very good. Okay. We will um, get rid of the red and we'll take a break. So we'll set up the required methods and we'll take a break and we'll come back. It's a good time. The what? What's that? <laughs> All right, um, let's go over to our extension for the uh, pick of view data source and let's set it up. So, what we need here, we need number of components. What are we returning? Return. Always think C for C, components, color. And here we have number of rows in components. And what are we returning here? What are we returning here, Julia? It, the pick of you needs to know how many rows it has. Um, labs that count. Thank you so much. So here we have labs that count. Great. And lastly, we will do what else do we need from the delegate? Title, right? So title for Jahid was saying. Eh? Oh, this is wrong. Thank you, sir, for pointing that out. Uh, we're not talking about document picker. That's if you want to create some document-based application where the user creates documents. Like there's a file system that you could save documents to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so here we are not creating the document picker, but here UI view picker, and we said title, title for row, title for row. So this particular delegate method, it's expecting some sort of string. So we need to return a string. We could get a string by accessing our array of labs. So the way we, ex we access the array of labs is labs, open square bracket, row. Okay? If, we had comp if we had multiple components, we would have to access it via the component, via the row. Very similar to sections of sections. 
but we're not going to do sections of sections, so please don't go overwhelming yourself there. Um, for now, only be um, able to do rows. There's no component, multiple components for now in our projects. So here we'll simply say return uh, labs row. And where's the row coming from? The row is coming from here. We have available to us the row. Very similar to our index path in our table view, we have access to the row. And as I said, again, if you have multiple columns, you would have to access it via the column, the row. Okay? But here we only have one component, so we don't have any component to worry about. It's only one component. Oh, so the row is basically That would be like section, um, right? Regardless, you need to return a string. So, but we have a string array already. So now we just index into it using the row value. All right. So let's test this out. Make sure we are all good, and then we'll take a break once we see our pickers showing up. Okay. Run your app. What happened if what? I mean, what was? What happened? What's the question? <laughs> <laughs> All right, run, run the app and confirm we have. <laughs> what questions? Sections are not working. Look at that. Who's going to answer that one? I'm really optimistic for us to actually create like an answers um, way to do stuff. That would be nice. Why? <laughs> Believe, man. Watch Polar Express again. Um, Okay, so we got our picker showing. Everybody got the picker showing. Yes, sir. The bottom of the UI picker view. Oh, sorry. Code? Okay. We all got our picker view showing. We could now take a break. Any questions before we take a break? Uh, click on the add button. Click on the add button. Tiffany? Click on the add like you're adding a, a, a lab. That's where we need it, when we're actually creating a lab. Any questions? Okay, so we'll stop here and we'll come back to continue on. <laughs>